my name is Sam. Thanks for checking out this video. If you get to the end and liked it, then subscribe, bell notification, give the video a thumbs up. Um, so wrap up. I think we're gonna do a slightly different, like, funnish or like whatever part. Just cause yeah, March was like just like the whole COVID thing. But as well, I had a lot of shit going on in my personal life, and so I didn't like write down a bunch of like jokes or things I thought. If things pop into my great brain, if great, if not, then I have a other thing that. We'll see how it goes at the end. Um, yeah. So, as always, I want to tell you the books that I read. I actually did read a large amount this month. Part of it being I was working from home for a good chunk of it. Um, as well as just wanting to escape. And, um, yeah. So, what books I read, highlights, and just other stuff at the end. So, starting off, I read All the Stars and Teeth by Adeline Grace. And then I was lucky. I read it by... <laughs> By audiobook actually and then I was lucky a couple days later that I was in Edmonton there's a secondhand um, book shop uh, there's a couple of them I guess but under that branch name in Edmonton there's a store cat which I loved and I found this it was an, a, a brand new <laughs> for half the price of buying it brand new from Indigo so I swiped that I also picked up a rogue princess I think it's B.R. Myers I really wanted to love that because it's a Canadian author I also picked up In the Key of Nira Gahani by Natasha Dean, um, just because I would have liked to have known going in um, that there is a death in this. So if you are grieving uh, the loss of a loved one, especially, um, just go in, go in knowing that because I didn't and I had a meltdown. Witches of Ash and Ruin by E. Latimer, Latimer, Nameless Queen by, I think it's Rebecca McLaughlin and I... See, I'll never forget the lyrics to basically any Disney movie growing up, but can I remember what blood type I am or author's names? No. I sadly DNF'd The Sound of Stars by Alicia Dow. I also tried to read but ended up DNFing Rebel Wing by... Oh my god, the author's name's not even kind of coming to me. No, I, it's on the cover right here. Rebel Wing. I'm sorry, author. My brain is glitching at this point. A Murderous Relation by Deanna Rayborn, the fifth book in the Veronica Speedwell series, which is an amazing series you should all read. I finished my reread of European Travel for the Monstrous Gentlewoman, which I immediately followed by reading The Sinister Mystery of the Mesmerizing Girl, so I have finished this trilogy. Scavenge the Stars by Tara Sim. The King of Crows by Libba Bray, so I am also done with this quartet. The Toll by Niall Schusterman. So, I am also done with this trilogy. I wrapped up so much shit this month. Belle Revolte by Lindsay Miller. Be Not Far From Me by Mindy McGinnis, because she's here to punch you in the feels. Liesel and Poe by Lauren Oliver. I also just realized when I was on Google or Goodreads or one of those websites, do you know how many books Lauren Oliver has published? Holy crap! Seven Deadly Shadows by Courtney Almeida and Valen Maitani. Bloodleaf by Crystal Smith. Tilly and the Lost Fairy Tales, the second book in the Pages and Co. series. The Call of the Rift Veil by Jay Waller, the second book in, I think it's just the Call of the Rift <laughs> series. The Deep and the Dark Blue graphic novel by Nikki Smith. Strangers by David Alexander Robertson. Alexander Robertson. Yeah, that's right. The Fountain of Silence by Ruta. I still don't know how to pronounce her last name. Sorry, girl. Se or something along that line. This book. This book was really good. I highly recommend it. She's like queen of historical fictions, it seems. Other Words for Home, which is a beautiful middle grade book written in verse. The Deep by Alma Katsu. I think that's right. Yeah. It's the Titanic uh, horror. Well, it wasn't really horror. It pitches the Titanic horror story. Which now that I'm thinking about it, like what part of the Titanic wouldn't have been a horror story? I also finally picked up Sudden Death by Alvaro Enrique, House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Keg, and unfortunately this is a DNF for me. The Kiss Quoted by Helen Huang is a reread. Gideon the Ninth by Tansen Moore as a reread. The Strangers by Margaret Peterson Haddocks, which is the first book in the Greystone Secrets series. The Life Below by Alexandra Monier, which is the sequel and I think conclusion uh, to the final six duology, I'm gonna say it is. The Shadows Between Us by Trisha Levenseller. Love Boat Taipei by Abigail Hing Wen as a reread. Empress of All Seasons by Emma Kojean, which unfortunately was a DNF. And I think finally was Upright Women Wanted by Sarah Gailey. That sounds right. I think. 
she, she's the author of the book Magic for Liars, I think it was called, that I read. So yeah, I managed to read a ton of books. I think it was like I finished 31 and then DNF'd four or five more. So I got through 35 titles, which I'm incredibly impressed with. I didn't really like impulse buy, I don't think, for the most part this month as well. So I feel like I, in the past couple months especially, I've, I feel like I've gotten a, a, a head an awful lot on books that I have owned, especially for a longer period of time. Sudden Death. Like I bought that book like two, three years ago and I've been saying I was going to read it for like forever. I think in videos too and it just hadn't got to it. The Ark for the Strangers has been sitting on my bookshelf for probably close to two years too now so like I'm really happy I finally got on that. So from like least to most favorite and I don't include DNFs in this so to also take that into account but I think my least favorite of this month was Witches of Ashen Ruin. I was so freaking hyped for this book. I lunged at it in January when I saw an arc at my conference. Like I would have pushed an old lady out of the way if there had been an old lady in front of me to get this arc. I was so freaking excited. Pitches modern witchcraft blends with ancient Celtic mythology a mesmerizing novel that's perfect for fans of Schwab and the chilling adventures of Sabrina like I'm all into this whole like gothic-y kind of vibe thing going on and like I enjoy Schwab's writing for the most part I'm not like a cult follower the follower the way some people are but I enjoyed this but like Mm, nothing happens and I was so frustrated that I didn't connect to like any of the characters despite a character literally having my name which is so rare in books despite surprisingly even though I don't have an uncommon name and like just nothing of it lived up to any of my hopes or hypes or anything like that and I can deal with books set in like Ireland or wherever where like nothing like plot wise necessarily happens that's like essentially like Moyer Fowley Doyle like a lot of her stuff is you tie to like the characters and everything but like this like just nothing nothing tied to me nothing like piqued my interest I thought maybe it was just because of the mood I was in while I was reading it it was right when I was traveling on like a greyhound bus to my grandfather's funeral so I was like maybe this just isn't a good time but then I was talking to other people and I'm like no like it just there was so much that didn't work I had such hype for it and just didn't come through and I was like oh okay so no it's not just me so yeah this just like just a flop unfortunately. I think most surprising read and is definitely surprising in a good way is In the Key by Nira Gahani by Natasha Dean. First off I'm not a big reader of contemporary as a whole. Um, I just I, especially with the world as it is I it just meh. Uh, and it's also more of a, a story that I think that when I was going into it I was like oh it's first generation immigrant um, living in like a super urban like parents pressure and everything like that and I was like I don't think that's something I'm really gonna be able to relate to. I grew up outside of Toronto in a not rural but I mean it was a small town um but it was relatively close to Toronto it was like my family is all like Acadian roots like we've been in Canada for centuries before Canada was Canada um and like we pissed off the British because we refused to leave in like the east coast all that stuff so like I don't have any of that experience I don't have any experience with my parents pressuring me to go into like sciences or whatever they were like you like hockey well you can play hockey we'll find a way to financially support that through grants or whatever if you want to you know you're gonna work you're gonna you can go work then we're not gonna say you can't work a job after school you will got into school great do you want to go into the humanities okay go into the humanities you figure your shit out on your own so I mean like that's something that like I can give my parents credit for that I never felt that sort of pressure from them to like do good I think it's because they had other shit to worry about but like I never had that sort of pressure I think that was kind of the I think only the connection I really had thinking going in um was like the the main character is not by any means wealthy her family is not wealthy um so I grew up pretty poor and then when I was reading this the main characters her her, her father and her mother and her grandma all live like together they don't have a ton of money um so they just kind of work paycheck to paycheck to try and get by her parents are constantly fighting and her father doesn't want her to become too canadian essentially um but her her uncle is like super wealthy they came i guess later to canada under different like circumstances that allowed them to take money with them when you i get when they were leaving their country originally that you weren't able to so they had to just leave everything so that was really interesting that i went huh so despite my me growing up poor I was lucky enough that especially in Canada hockey is extremely expensive um so I went lucky enough that whenever I was on teams that I feel this feels braggy but like they wanted me on their team as the goalie so a lot of the times they would like reduce what my registration fees were because they knew we couldn't afford it or I got my equipment donated to me or like super discounted because someone ordered it and never picked it up or like we found ways around it and then there is like grants like the the Canadian tire grants and all that sort of stuff and like I think my mom made a ton of sacrifices for that so I was lucky enough but when I went and played hockey 
the level of wealth some of my teammates had and that was always the teammate that we went to like the the house for the cram for the the team christmas dinner or their parents owned a bakery so we always went there so there was just always like i was it was very weird on the outside like looking in like realizing that oh these families all have this much money to have a house this big and they go on vacation and they go to all these sports camps and everything i'm like i know i my family would never be able to afford something like this so i that's not something i would even think of um so it was really interesting seeing those parallels with this character, but I think there's also just this need to want to fit in, which I was a kind of an outsider when I was growing up. So I feel like there was a lot more that I connected with this character than I thought I was going to, as well as just a really good story. The ending really surprised me too. Um, and then I had a total meltdown at the end of it because there's a death. And like, I just... <laughs> I, I ended up enjoying this a whole lot more than I thought I was going to, as well as the fact that I don't play any musical instruments I never had. I never took any piano lessons or anything like that. So I was surprised at how much I connected to this character. And it was nice reading a book being like, oh, I know where they're talking about. I've been there. Because so few books are set in Canada. Oh, boy. And favorite. Um, <laughs> I just, I kind of knew this was going to happen this month, especially. I couldn't really narrow it down much more than this. Um, so I'm not super surprised. I love everything Trisha Loventhaler seems to put out, but The Shadows Between Us was so damn good. It's a Slytherin book, and I somehow came out rooting for the murderers. So I don't know what to do with that information, but it was so damn good. I thought The Toll was a super solid wrap-up, which is, like, a rare thing that I feel like I don't get a lot of good rap books where, like, the series ends, and I'm like, I feel satisfied with this. Like, it all ended. Everything was tied up. I need. I got all the information I needed. It wasn't, like, super obvious the whole time. Like, I got what I needed out of this book. Don't think anyone is super surprised that I loved a murderous relation. Um, I'm super excited to see where six and seven are gonna go, especially with like how what things happens what things happen between Veronica and Stoker in this one. I'm very curious to see if it's gonna change everything. So I um oh yeah, I'm so excited. I was just I don't know that she could put together a book that I don't like in this series, to be totally honest. And lastly, if you like were like, yo, I'm gonna shoot your dogs if you don't pick just one book which, first of all, that's really aggressive. I don't appreciate that. But I would pick The King of Crows by Libba Bray. This was a fantastic, such a good wrap-up for the series. I feel like a lot of series, like, you can tell when we're halfway through the last book that they have to start, like, okay, we've shifted gears. We're wrapping things up. I didn't get the sense here. I feel like it's been, it was, a like, keeping the same energy, you know, that kind of concept. I feel like this is, like, that whole series. It keeps the same energy, and each book just gets progressively better and better, and everything is built up on top of each other, so you, you're you attached to all these characters by this point, and, like, especially because we waited so long, which, like, I hate that we had to wait, like, two years, but, like, also I feel like it really helped the book in some way. Um, but, yeah, I just... This series was fantastic, and this was an, an exceptionally impressive wrap-up. And just because I had shit going on this month, um, I didn't write down things that made me, like, popped into my brain or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I just figured we'd go through, like, the little inkling thing at the end that has, like, a every quarter or whatever has, like, a current love, books, The Diviners by the Libba Br by that whole, whole, oh my god, I can't speak, The Diviners Quartet by Libba Bray. I was so damn salty about that book. Like, especially last year when I was, like, finally, like, I literally read it because I hated the, fir the first book's cover changes so much. It was literally a prompt to read a book that you hated the covers of. And, like, shit just, like, went down ever since then. I am so happy. I finally, through, like, whatever, have all of the Australian covers. But my fun fact is I have two books that are the taller ones and two are the smaller ones. I knew that was going to happen because of the dynamic, like, the dimensions on the book depository, but I had to wait for, and I think it's because there was a paper shortage, and I think there is still a paper shortage, um, The Diviners and Before the Devil um, Breaks You were, like, um, out of stock, I think it was, and so I don't think the the full-size ones were coming back in stock, or they, they were also out of stock, so I was just had notifications on all of them being, like, notify me when any stock comes in, and I finally got them. I didn't pay attention to what dimensions they were, and I didn't it t they all kind of came so close together too that I think I had ordered all four of them before I finally got the first one to find out exactly the dimensions. So I think the next goal in my life will be to try and get them all in the tall ones because I, I actually really love both of them. If I can get both of the, like the tall and the shorts, I wouldn't be mad about it. Um, but I think of the two, I like the taller one the better, I think. Yeah. But either way, I have the whole series. The Australian covers are gorgeous. Um, I just don't understand what the actual shit happened with the North American covers. They're an absolute abysmal nightmare. And it actually pisses me off because of how good the books are and because of how diverse they are. It's actually like, 
Libba Bray didn't give the world that series for them to be treated that way. It's like the author of Glitch Kingdom, Sheena, something like that. How dare you have an author go, th go through the route of, of traditional publishing, which is a nightmare in itself, and honestly seems kind of financially exploitive, um, and then give them that cover. Like, bitch, what? I would be, I would be so damn livid and never go back to traditional publishing if I got the cover of Glitch Kingdom, which is a whole other video topic that I want to do, I think is like really bad book covers. Um, and boy, is that a highlight of them. Glitch Kingdom was so bad. I want to read it, but I, I could not ever justify spending a dollar, I don't think, on the, on a book with that cover. Like, good lord, that is a bad cover. Author that I'm kind of in love with always is Deanna Rayborn. <laughs> Especially as this quarter because a murderous relation finally came out. And I'm just so excited for whatever's gonna happen in the rest of that damn series because I just need everyone to read Veronica Speedwell. And also it says OTP One True Pairing of Veronica Speedwell and Stoker because as you can tell, I filled out this quarterly thing right after I finished a murderous relation. And I'm really happy with how everything went down in a murderous relation. Especially like the plot itself was really interesting. But especially between Veronica and Stoker. I was like kinda concerned where if we were gonna like go through this whole book series and like everything was gonna die if they finally hooked up, like that my what was that tv show i never watched it but i know of it that cop tv show where they had that and then as soon as they actually hooked up it like boomed um or if they were gonna get to the end and there was like never any payoff like what they did with the veronica speed uh with the veronica mars hulu the way they ended it and everyone's like are you fucking kidding me i, I wanted somewhere in the middle and i got that tv shows <laughs> tiger king this was such a <laughs> If you haven't watched Tiger King, I really honestly recommend you do. I am not, like, okay, definitely. Carol Baskin killed her husband and fed it to a tiger. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not saying he didn't deserve it, because her husband was kind of a piece of garbage from the sounds of it. Um, and, like, you do you, sis, so someone's gonna, like, you, you protect yourself. Um, and I'm not someone who's, like, Carol Baskin is, like, evil and Joe Exotic. Joe Exotic is, like, an incredibly mad. That, I'm just confused as to, like, how this entire, like, realm situation exists. Also, how is a tiger only $2,000 American? That is confusingly inexpensive. Um, I just, I mean, Joe Exotic especially is like a very like, kind of, it seems like a, like someone I would never be friends with. It's great that he hires like very diversely and gives people a space that they can come out of prison and still find work. But also he pays them like $100 a week and lets them live in like run down apartments and like he makes them work 12 hour shifts five to seven times a week. Like how is that? Like that's, that's slave labor at best. Like, and then like just the whole, like, uh, like, n like neglect of, of animals that shouldn't, and then breeding and then selling, exacerbating the problem and then being like, we're the good ones. Cause we let people hold a cub and tell them that they're a cub. Like that is just so, and there's like the sex cults in it. It's so messed up. I'm not saying it's a fun, I'm not, no, I'm not saying, I'm not saying these people are good. I'm saying this whole situation is so weird and so fascinating. And I don't know how this all happened. And it's not like an entirely scripted reality show. Okay. I just don't understand how all of this is existing. Also, Carol definitely killed her husband. They were moving. Um, Atlantis, because we just, we've been doing lots of group watches in the TBR and Beyond group, and we've been going through the back catalog and the, the Golden Vault of Disney Plus especially, and like, oh, Atlantis is so much better than I even remembered. I hadn't watched it in a little while, and like, I, I want to, I think I'm very soon going to go watch the sequel again. Also, I'm going to watch the 2018 Robin Hood, because I didn't know it was on Amazon Prime, and I have an Amazon Prime subscription now, because I wanted to watch The Mummy, and The Mummy is on Amazon Prime, and so like, I... I just love everything Talon is in and Jamie Foxx. And, like, I remember watching the trailer and being like, oh, this is going to be a horrible Robin Hood adaptation. But I feel like I would just enjoy it as, like, an action medieval movie. And I'm finally going to read it or watch it. Also, when I Googled, not Googled, when I searched in Amazon Prime Robin Hood, someone please tell me why the Beverly Hillbillies showed up as a search result, like, number five. Someone please explain it to me. Is there a cast member named Robin Hood and the Beverly Hillbillies? I've watched it before, but I don't remember anything with Robin Hood involving in the Beverly Hillbillies whatsoever. Music. Um, BTS came out with a new album, so. Also, like, for real fam, it's probably one of my, like, my second favorite album from them. I don't think anything will be better than their album Dark and Wild, which just, like, chef's kiss, it's a work of art. Um, but, like, Map of the Soul 7 has a song called Louder Than Bombs, which is, like, with Troy Sivan, and oh my god, it is such a sexy song, but so good and catchy. Also, I will never get over Dionysus as a song. Also, you all need to stop pretending you don't know how to pronounce Dionysus. Um, and, um, oh god, the uh, We Are Bulletproof Eternal, like, hits me in the goddamn feels. Also, I know a bunch of people are like, eh, about 
J-Hope's Ego song, his solo in it, as the wrap-up to the song. But I fucking love Ego so much. I cannot... I've literally, like, parked my car in my back driveway and then sat there for another two minutes waiting for Ego to end because I cannot, in my heart of hearts, turn my car off and not finish Ego. It could be because of me is my fucking bias. I don't know. But also, I'm heartbroken that they delayed the concert because I managed to get fucking floor seats for the Toronto show. I know they're delaying it for, like, a valid reason, but also, like, if they delay it and, like, it just never comes to pass because at the end of this year, Jin has to go enlist in the military. I'm not gonna be okay if I don't get to see Jin perform, like, serendip- not serendipity. What's the fuck? Oh my god, I'm blanking. Okay. I just need to make sure that I see a concert with Jin because that man is a treasure and he is a beautiful treasure food oh my god okay I definitely ate this instant noodle when I was like I don't know if I was living in Halifax or St. Catharines in my undergrad or graduate degree but when I moved here to Alberta I just couldn't find it and I was like oh well I guess I'm done eating instant noodles they probably weren't the most healthiest thing for me anyways also I have an actual income so I can eat proper food now um but then whilst out looking I was like I was hoping in my heart of hearts, this sounds bad, but I live in a very racist geographic area, okay? Um, just, just a lot of racist, homophobic, sexist sort of people. I was like banking on, oh, they, they'll destroy the aisle with pasta in it, like the, the hoarders and the Karens. They will destroy it. They won't touch the ethnic food aisle or the Asian food aisle, but motherfucker, they did. All of the instant noodles were gone. And I was like... I was super broke because I had to spend all that money going to Quebec. I was like, I just need instant noodles to have enough food to get through the end of the month. Okay? Like, please, what the fuck? Where are all the instant noodles? And, like, all of them. Like, the shelves were bare. I was banking. I could assume that these people would be racist enough to not touch the Asian food aisle. But they did. They fucking destroyed it. So, I by chance went to London Drugs. And, oh my god, I found my old instant noodle things. And now I cannot stop eating them again. I don't know what the actual brand name is. I don't know what the fuck the seafood, like, the flavor is or whatever. Penang, white, curry, me. All I know is this white curry chili. And, like, oh, it's so good spicy. And, like, it says seafood. So, I've just been putting shrimp and green beans with it and eating it, like, literally every day. And I, by fluke, scanned it on my app, like, my diet thing app and it actually is low in sodium maybe it's because I was always like oh everything's like Mr. Noodles but like bitch no it's low in sodium I don't understand so I just keep eating this every day and it's like $3.99 for a pack of four which is expensive for Mr. Noodles but oh my god it's so worth it because the spices are like awesome and now I just got like I just go buy a seafood mix at the store and like just mix it in and like takes like less than five minutes and it's so damn filling oh the spice is good beverages okay like normally I'm like an ice caramel macchiato girl around this season like we finished up pumpkin season we finished up the the um Christmas either peppermint or um uh what's the chestnut praline which I really love that one too so we'd like go back to our originals and then it gets summer and then just that iced coffee with a little bit of caramel it's a nice little perk thing but like oh my god okay at home I've been drinking a latte like once or twice a day and it's chocolate oat milk with hazelnut espresso you do not understand how delicious it is. <laughs> and also, I can't stop drinking carbonated water. I think I have an actual problem. Um, everywhere I go, I'm finding new brands. So I don't know if it's finally expanding. But carbonated water without sweetener in it. Like, there used to just, like, not be anything. It was always just, like, sweetened with stevia. And I'm like, no, that's still sweetened. Stevia is disgusting. Please stop pushing that shit on me. But, like, then we had the company Bubbly came. You know, they're the ones that have Michael Buble as their promo person, which is like the most genius fucking marketing I've ever seen. Um, but then I finally found La Croix up here. I have not seen it anywhere up here. I don't know what the fuck happened, but I finally found it. So I just bought like all the flavors I could find of that. And then Bubbly, the orange and the strawberry, are the most superior ones. And then I found a company called AHA, A-H-A, and like they have like pomegranate and blueberry ones. They're all really good. So like literally the bottom shelf of my fridge is literally just a row of different flavored water, like carbonated sparkling water. I can't stop. I mean, there's far worse addictions to drinking than I could have like Coke or Diet Coke, but like, I can't stop. And last thing was like, where have you traveled? I actually did a fair amount of traveling. In this past quarter, I went to Toronto for my conference at the end of January. And then when I was there, I went to see my mom in Quebec. I went to St. Catharines to do a day trip to Book Outlet and to grab um, something at uh, uh, food at this alehouse that I went to when I was 
going to school there called like Merchant Ale House. It's really good. Um, and then I visited for a day before having a blow up fight with my family, um, Orangeville. So like, and then I went to Ottawa and then I went to uh, Stansted, Quebec to see my grandfather. And that ended up being the last time I saw him. So then I came back to Alberta and, and then I went to Edmonton at the end of, no, at the beginning of, of March for a work conference. I was there for a couple days um, in the French Quarter, which if you've never been to the French Quarter of Edmonton, yeah. There's a French Quarter of Edmonton. I didn't know that either. Um, and then I flew back to Toronto because flights to Ottawa were astronomically expensive because of the Via Train protests thing. So I had to fly to Toronto and then take a Greyhound just trying to ensure that I do get a disease or die or get behead. If you're Canadian, you'll understand the joke of the beheading and the Greyhound. Well, it's not really a joke. That shit happened. Um, and then I took the Greyhound from Toronto to Ottawa and then took a car from Ottawa back to Stansted and then took her back to, to Ottawa and then took a Greyhound back to Toronto and then came back to Alberta for my boss to say, we're going to need you to quarantine for two weeks, which <laughs> justified understanding. Oh my God, this video is probably so long. I'm so sorry if I spoke way too fast. This is just, I, yeah, I can't do anything about that that's just how I am so yeah um I'll link these books in the description box down below I'll also link all of my social media if you follow me I will follow you back and like let me know what your favorites books beverages whatever the hell the list was that was in the little inkling planner and yeah <laughs>